ideas ruled the world. Advanced and some developing economies, having invested sufficiently in their education sectors, continue to generate robust ideas that shape the global spheres. Africa is yet to partake in this global market of ideas because its population is yet to be adequately prepared for the unfolding global competition. The result is a consumer Africa that depends on the ideas of others for its sustenance. The program is Economic Searchlight on Splash 105.5 FM, the Integrity Station. This edition of the program will feature a former president of the Nigerian Economic Society, Professor Akin Iwayemi. We will be looking at the underdevelopment of the Nigerian state. I will also bring you my 2015 interview with the businessman Tony Elumelu at one of the side meetings of the United Nations in New York. In the interview, we looked at African countries driving the Sustainable Development Goals as means to development. I am Edmond Obilo. Let's hit the ground running. There is no doubt that the African continent has a narrow world view, the reason it is yet to rise above the primordial political sentiments holding back its development. A country like Nigeria, one of the biggest producers of oil, cannot adequately take care of the oil needs of its people. For decades, the country has continued to battle scarcity of petroleum products, with the political class constantly in the trial and error game. The APC government of Muhammad Buhari has joined the League of Governments that stumbled perpetually on the nagging issue. Is either the government is saying subsidy is a fraud or later agreeing to pay subsidy. At other times, it tells the people that petrol can sell for a cheaper price than what obtained during the last PDP government. The conclusion in some quarters is that the government is confused about the problems of the downstream sector. The government recently announced that it has deregulated the downstream sector of the oil industry. But from the look of things, this does not look like a full deregulation. Omar Gabriel of the Vanguard newspaper in his article asked, Is this deregulation or price adjustment? His question arose from the position of government that marketers cannot sell petrol above 145 naira per liter. How do one interpret the announcement by the Petroleum Product Pricing and Regulatory Agency PPPRA, that the actual price of petrol should have been 243 naira per liter? Does this mean there is still subsidy? Who is subsidizing who? This was the question Muhammad Buhari asked while campaigning to be president. To him at the time, subsidy did not exist. And uh, we also built more than 20 depots. I couldn't remember the number of uh, pumping stations. And we got the tankers abroad. It saved the economy. We used less fuel. Um, uh, we saved a lot of lives. We save roads. And then when I came back again, the head of state somehow. Um, <laughs> and I was lucky to get a professor at Tem Debbie, who was a highly committed Nigerian. And we pounced on illegal bankery. And people abandoned their barges and tankers and ran for their dear lives. <laughs> We, all our depots, we were choked with products. And we, were, we started exporting 100,000 barrels a day of refined products up to a satisfying home market. <laughs> so honestly, I was in a state of shock when subsequent government reduced us into net importers and built in 
so much overheads in it that Nigerian will have to go and look for fuel from Europe or America as any non-producing country will do. And then the question of this subsidy is still baffling me. Who is subsidizing who? <laughs> I can understand Nigerians to buy at the end of the project at filling station the cost of per barrel of different Nigerian crude at wellhead, the cost of transportation to the refinery, the cost of refining, and the cost of refined products to the filling station. Maybe with some overhead so that the, the oil doesn't come too cheap. But people start off talking of subsidy. Who is subsidizing who? Who is subsidizing who? Perhaps the president can answer the question now. The regulation would not permit price fixing by government. Omar Gabriel of the Vanguard insists that if the government was serious with deregulation, it would have scrapped the PPPRA as it would no longer be relevant in the pricing of products or at best redefine its role in price modulation. He said it seems there is still element of subsidy if the actual price of petrol is about 100 naira above the PPPRA price. Who in this circumstance will pay the difference, he asked. Equally, the government would have removed the Petroleum Equalization Fund as well as the bridging fund used to pay importers the difference between landing cost and transportation of products to different parts of the country. With the Nigerian economy in a state of flux, Policymakers must think outside the box to put the country on the path of development. The country must know that the innovations of a generation are not simple wishes. They are works of deep reasoning for changing stereotypes, improving standards and encouraging education. Man has an abundant talent for innovations, giving prescription to new problems and turning the problems of yesterday to the inventions of today. African countries like Nigeria continue to consume the maverick discoveries and innovations of others, while the producers in the West and rising Asian giants in turn continue to extract resources from Africa for their manufacturing sectors, thus undermining the potential for development in a peripheral country like Nigeria. How then does Africa tend to rework its strategy? Tony Elumelu, the chairman of Highest Holdings and the founder of the Tony Elumelu Foundation, in this 2015 chart, at one of the side meetings of the United Nations in New York, says the private sector has the potential to drive development in Africa. Yeah, we are talking about sustainable development for yeah. the world. Yeah. Do you think Africa is even ready for development? Africa is more than ready for development. The issue is that we need our government to create the enabling environment that will enable the private sector to play its own part in helping to develop the continent. And that's what I preach and that's what African capitalism, the development philosophy I propounded, that's what it's, uh, it's all about. This um, sustainable development goal is good for Africa and we should take advantage of it. The African private sector should come together and, and work to make SDG possible. Is it possible to make SDG, SDG attainable in Africa? It is. But we'll have a role to play. The development world, the business community, the government, all of us should, the NGOs, all of us should come together to work to make it. Because poverty anywhere is a threat to all of us, wherever we are, wherever we might be. And a particular mention is the goal seven and eight. Seven talks about sustainable energy for all. And you know that without access to electricity, we can make progress. The goal seven, eight talks about the inclusive growth, inclusive development, which Africa has preaches, meaning that poverty, we need to eradicate poverty, we need to create employment, we need to, to make sure that the economy grows in a manner that everyone is growing. But the fear is that when we could not take advantage of the MDGs, how are we sure we can run with the SDGs? It's not a question of, of taking advantage of MDG. Nigeria is making progress. Nigeria of 10 years ago is not Nigeria of today. So the good thing, good thing is for to keep
keep making progress. Pro you know, and um, I think that the Sustainable Development Goals have come at an auspicious time, at the time that we as a country are ready, largely, and at the time that we have all, we're all beginning to see the vicious impact of poverty and lack of economic development and social progress. So hopefully all of us should rally around the private sector, the public sector, the government, the development world, the NGOs, all of us should come together to make sure that the sustainable development goals they succeed. On my part, as the chairman of SODINS and the chairman of Transnational Corporation of Niger Transco, we have invested in power. Goal S7 is about access to electricity, energy. I don't know if you recall, last year I was invited by United Nations Secretary General to address the United Nations General Assembly when they were developing these SDGs. And on record, and to my great satisfaction, is the fact that I canvassed as a electricity as part of the Sustainable Development Goals is there now. So I feel fulfilled. I canvass also for inclusive economic growth through the concept and philosophy of African capitalism. That is goal eight. So as a person, as a private sector leader, I was the private sector voice that was they invited when they were developing the SDG. I'm accomplished, I feel satisfied, but that is one percent of the job. The big job is for all of us globally and more importantly in Africa to work together to make sure that the SDG goals, especially as it relates to what helps will help Africa deal with the issue of unemployment, deal with the issue of acute poverty, deal with the issue of poor access to electricity. So long as we can deal with all of this, work together to deal with this, Africa will take off. Again, on the philanthropy side, my foundation, the Tony Elmelo Foundation, is doing its best. I launched the $100 million Tony Elmelo Entrepreneurship Program. This is to help empower the African next generation of African leaders. And now we have a thousand beneficiaries from 52 African countries. 20,000 apply from 55 African countries, we choose 1,000. And every year we do 1,000 every year. So that over a period of 10 years, we would have touched 10,000 land. That's $100 million, $10 million every, every year. So if others can also do similar things, use economic activities, our commercial ventures and activities to create the platform and the tools that will enable the country to take off, like we're doing power, it will help. If they also can use part of their wealth to endow or support and empower other Africans, like we're doing through the Tony Melo Foundation, that will also help. So in the final analysis, a private sector-led economy is the way out for Nigeria and Africa? Yes, the private sector. That was my call when I was invited by the Secretary General to the United Nations General Assembly last year. My call was that you cannot plan today's SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal, by excluding the private sector. You need to bring the private sector because the private sector has the resources to make things happen both financial capital resource, intellectual resource, and the logistics that can help things happen. And I'm happy that that has not been incorporated. These views have been incorporated. So for SDG to work, all of us have to work together, the private sector, the public sector, the development agencies, institutions, NGOs, all of us will work together. And in Africa in particular, there's no other way. The private sector must sit at the table and work with government after all of this, the, this launch here, I would like the AU, I will call on the African Union to sit together with the private sector in Africa and say, how can we make the sustainable development goals a reality in Africa within a, sh a shorter space of time, not wait for 15 years. And then we form an agenda that will begin to work to us. Speaking there with Tony Elumelu, he serves as a member of the Global Advisory Board of the United Nations Sustainable Energy for All Initiative and USAID's Private Capital Group for Africa Partners Forum. Development is a process of expanding opportunities for members of the society and mobilizing the full range of their capabilities and resources for the common benefit of the state. On the basis of this, 
The reason why Nigeria still remains underdeveloped is not far-fetched. A country that has many of its citizens unemployed and underemployed is not mobilizing the full range of its citizens' capabilities. It is only when majority is engaged in productive activities that a country can begin to talk about development. This is what I will be discussing with Professor Akin Iwayami, a former president of the Nigerian Economic Society, after this break. The program is Economic Searchlight on Splash 105.5 FM, the Integrity Station. The program is Economic Search Light on Splash 105.5 FM, the Integrity Station. My guest on this part of the program is a former president of the Nigerian Economic Society, also a former president of the Nigerian Association of Energy Economics. He is a principal investigator, Center for Petroleum Energy Economics and Law, University of Ibadan. Professor Aki Iwayemi, it's good to have you on Economic Search Light. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on your program. Do you worry about the economic future of your country, Nigeria? Does this look like a country prepared for the future? Well, in some ways, our political managers and economic managers are telling us that they are preparing for the future. But when you look at some dimensions of the problems facing Nigeria, you begin to wonder whether really we are looking at some of the long-term fundamentals that should shape the economy, given certain political and social conditions, and even economic conditions that exist now. The grand question in Nigeria, to my mind, is that why has that dream of being a developed and prosperous nation eluded us since we became actually a major oil exporting country? That is the biggest question that we have not thoroughly answered. Do you believe that Nigerian poverty is as a result of the historical development of the international capitalist system? Well, I don't subscribe to that. I don't subscribe to that because I think we are the architect of our own fortune or misfortune. Uh, let's even take the poverty you're talking about. The question is, how do you reduce the level of poverty, you know, in a society or in an economy? You know, Nigeria is a multi-dimensional society. If we look at the past, the way that many of us exited poverty was through education. And education through the public sector, not private uh, sector education, public sector. Because when you are educated, you, you know, uh, although your parents are poor, you can go through schools, go through primary, secondary, you get to the university, uh, and you graduate. You're able to fend for poverty. But look at what is happening today. Public schools are a shadow of what they used to be. In terms of helping to uplift children from low-income families to exit poverty. Just imagine what will happen if we have put amount of money in the educational sector to develop public sector education. Uh, now the government is buying into uh, feeding a child a meal a day. Actually, I've been conversing this for a long time as an alternative to fuel subsidy. That the money you are spending on fuel subsidy, you can use it to provide a meal a day for a child in Nigeria, that, that the externality effects of that meal a day on the child's mental growth, huh? keeping him or her in school, exiting poverty, you know, the, 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 the benefits are immense. Is it not a long-term thing? There are short-term parts of it. Public schools, you put money in there, prove their facilities, okay? give them the kids 
um, a meal a meal a day actually it happens in the developed world because they know at that level where they are growing up that's the best time to develop their brain and capacity to think not the rotated learning we are doing here cram and powder but the ability to create you know things look our educational system is part of the problem now you know this craze for private education kids in kindergarten that should be learning how to coordinate brain and hand and cutting they are cramming state capital they are cramming so with that cramming mentality there's no way you can begin to think and i'll give you a simple example what i'm talking about you see some years ago my son was uh, actually primary one okay here before we traveled out and when we traveled out they returned him to kindergarten because he said his age you know it was not not yet six they returned him to kindergarten and the kindergarten is cutting things and putting shapes together and you know building conceptualizing things and doing things he's an engineer today you know his ability to think and create things that's what we need in nigeria these are private schools i just you know sorry to say not all of them but many of them they are not gearing our young ones to be creative and to be innovative and the country that wants to develop must have creative minds innovative minds supported by the both uh, governmental and society infrastructure. So basically, it is not a thing of economic model, capitalism, socialism. We have models that can back this up. The model that will back this up will say that, okay, there are components of a system. What is the objective of the society? The objective of the society may be multidimensional. Huh? It wants economic growth. It wants poverty reduction. It wants improved living standards. Okay, how do you achieve this? Okay, there are alternative routes to achieving this. And the beauty of then of an economic plan is to look at the alternatives and provide the cost and benefit alternative so that you, the one you are choosing, you know what the implication would be. That is a fundamental thing we are missing out. You need to look at alternatives and the cost and benefit of alternatives and choose that alternative that will give you the highest net benefit. I was going through the Japanese model. I looked at how countries like Taiwan, South Korea, Hong Kong, and Singapore learned from them. If we decided to fix the bits and pieces, education, and then decide to go for our model, will you recommend economic nationalism? Well, Economic nationalism, if that economic nationalism will ensure that your products, what you produce, you know, are competitive both locally and internationally. There's absolutely no reason why since 1970 till date, Nigeria is not the petrochemical and refining hub of Africa. No reason. Absolutely no reason why we should not be the hub for Africa. Because the crude oil is here, the gas is here. So instead of being exporters of crude oil and uh, natural gas, why have we not gone down the value chain, you know, to produce and export, you know, uh, so we produce for both domestic consumption and export. It's a tragedy that Nigeria missed this boat largely because of failure of the government agents in charge of the oil sector, the, the NNPC. But it's not NNPC that is the problem, actually. It's the political actors who have used NNPC in a way that has not allowed NNPC to function properly. I can tell you that NNPC has within its staff among the best people in different areas of the oil industry globally. But it's the political economy of Nigeria that has destroyed that excellence to be able to do what they need to do. 
uh, Petro, Baras, Petronas, all of those, you know, they are state oil companies. But they allow the freedom to do what they need to do and do them well. But in Nigeria, the politics of Nigeria, you know, failed NMPC and failed Nigeria. Because everything is about sharing, not about excellence, not about who can deliver, you know, in a globalized world, very competitive globalized world. Until no. Nigeria you now begins to think like that, that look, yes, we want to be, uh, we want to have economic nationalism, but that economic nationalism is that we produce not only for ourselves, but we can produce competitively to sell not only in Africa, but the rest of the world. Can we forget the influence of government and drive the economy through the private sector? That's what we are beginning to do. And we are beginning to do it, to my mind, not in a holistic way. You see, you must have an, a business environment that will encourage investors to come to your country. Because, you see, many parts of the world are competing for this scarce capital. So if your environment is not conducive, people who want to come to your environment will be those people who want to come and quickly make their money and go away. They have no long-term stake in your system. So we call it hot money. They will come when your stock market is up, and they will go away when things are down. But you want long-term investors who will contribute to production sector of the economy, then your environment for business must be good. And in recent times, it's not been too good. Because if, for example, I come in to set up a, a refinery here, and I spend a billion dollars huh, to set up a 100,000 barrels a day refinery, those who contributed to the money will expect that when my refinery starts to produce, I can pay them dividends I can take the, my money out. But the current foreign exchange uh, story is, you know, uh, manufacturing sector is crying out loud. Actually, it, you, you need a policy regime that is relatively stable. Because when you begin to change, you know, then uh, investors will, you know, uh, they, will, they will penalize you, you know, because of the way they will come to invest. And let me give an example here that, we can do, actually we can produce world class, world class standard. Recently I was at, uh, on, a, on a free trade, oil and gas free trade zone. And I was impressed with what those guys are doing in Onne. You know, with world class facilities. So Nigeria can do it. Nigeria can do it. Once we allow those who know how to do these things best to do them. Do we need to apply protectionism here? You see, protectionism from economic theory is an impediment to long-term growth. If you want to protect, you should do like what they did in China or even Southeast Asia. It's carrot and stick. I'm going to give you this protection for maybe a number of years, and there are targets deliverables. Once you don't deliver, there's no more protection for you. Because the argument in literature is how long will an industry become infant? It can't remain infant forever. The Nigerian case is once you begin to protect, not only in Nigeria, actually elsewhere, once you begin to protect an industry, you create an interest group, they will be lobbying for that protection to continue. So there will be many interest groups looking for its own so have a level playing field that will provide incentive for producers to produce what they know how to produce best. And uh, government provides the environment of security, environment of stable policy, environment to encourage those who want to produce to produce. But the current uh, regime of state uh, governed uh, system will not work. It's difficult to fight the markets. You will tell us more after this break. The program is Economic Search Light on Splash 105.5 FM, the Integrity Station. I am discussing with Professor Aki Iwayemi, a former president of the Nigerian Economic Society. We'll be back after this break, so don't go away.
Welcome back. The program is Economic Search Light. Professor Akin Iwayemi, a principal investigator at the Center for Petroleum Energy Economics and Law, University of Ibadan, is my guest. You know, sometimes it bothers critical mind why Africa remains the laggard of the world, including Nigeria. If European countries in the 17th century knew what they wanted and they were able to hit their target, why have we remained acutely underdeveloped? Let me give you a simple example. You see, uh, except you apply science and technology to what you are doing, you remain at the perpetual level that you see around us. Let me illustrate this. You will expect a, a Greek graduate, okay, who have gone to the university to be change agents for farmers outside, right? In terms of uh, science and technology, irrigation, huh? hmm? and the application of simple tools that. But uh, let me use the University of Ibadan here. And it happens at all, virtually all the Faculty of Agriculture. They are still using cutlass and hoe. They are wetting the farms where, you know, with a bucket. And you ask yourself, why can't they design simple irrigation scheme and use it? And then they go out there, they begin to introduce that to the farmers. Why don't they design simple implements? It doesn't have to be huge, uh, mechanized system. So as you begin to introduce science and technology to improve productivity in agriculture. Farming will not be attractive to young people. And part of the problem actually is the staff. The staff themselves must also be creative to, encourage, you know, to introduce to students, this is what we need to do. So it's across the spectrum. You know, sorry to say the Nigerian educational system uh, as it is, is too much it's not geared towards innovation. It's not geared towards uh, application of modern techniques. You know, because there's so much rotted land. If you go through economic literatures, you, you, you see what European and American intellectuals did to lift their countries out of poverty. We have the Professor Ewayemi. Yes. How come we've not had that super recommendation like what the Freedmans did, the Alexander Hamiltons did, how come our intellectuals are not bold enough? Okay. Uh, in those countries you're talking about, they know the value of their intellectuals, whether they're in the universities or their research institutes, or even in the private companies, because intellectuals are across the spectrum in those countries and they know what they do, and they partner with them. I've told some people that there is no country that has developed in the last 100, 200 years where there is no collaboration between the intellectual and the, and the in, and industry and government. It's a partnership, and it's a win-win partnership. But when you um, marginalize your intellectual, uh, for political reasons, then you get the results you are getting. And really, intellectuals are not political animals. They want to call a spade a spade. The way of the position is slightly different from that. We know many intellectuals have been corrupted by politicians. But I think for the interest of the nation, there's need for a deeper collaboration between uh, the, the university system and research institutes and the government and industry. That is the only way Nigeria can make it. Now, there's so much ad hoc. Uh, universities follow the British tradition of ivory towerism. They are separated from this. It's only in recent time they are trying to come in to you know, uh, have some collaboration. Let me illustrate with a simple story. Uh, recently, a friend of mine is into production of uh, uh, 
a POP for sealing material. So I was trying to, you know, uh, change his input mix. Okay. He imports the input. So he wanted to now add like sawdust to this input so that it can produce another quality uh, POPs but at a lower cost. And he didn't get the mix right. So I told him, look, why don't you approach chemistry department somewhere? He did not come to his own. He said, we'll just take my money. So I told him, okay, I will have him talk to somebody in chemistry. And I connected the two of them. And it was a win-win. I was able to get the proper blending. The guy there in the chemistry department, you know, is part of his research. So these are the kind of things that need to be done for Nigeria to, that's what happened in South Korea you are talking about. There must be, you know, it's internally driven. No amount of foreigners will come. Your people themselves are not part, part of the process. So we need this synergy. And the politicians should stop marginalizing academics. These academics don't like running around. In the developed countries, they know who to go to, and they go to them and get, you know, this result is win-win for the country. They society. should be thinking for the country. Yes. Like what you have now, you know, uh, we should have a group that will be looking at the Nigerian economic scenario and the alternatives and the implication of this. That's what happens in the developed world. To my mind now, you know, the input of economics is not as it should be in this current uh, government, you know, in looking at EU from different dimensions because, you see, two heads are better than one. And when diversity of discussion leads to getting, you know, uh, a blueprint, it produces a better blueprint than just one segment of the thinkers doing it. So, do we even uh, have a, a blueprint to critically examine? There's no blueprint now for <clears throat> development. That's why I, when we started a discussion, that when you look at the future of this country and the demography of this country, you know, it gives one you know, some uh, shudder that we're really thinking of what's going to happen in 2040, 2050. If our population is going to be like 400 million, some are forecasted. I mean, Look at the implication that will have for education and health infrastructure, poverty, employment. If three quarters of our population now is uh, under 30, imagine the kind of crisis. So we really need at different levels, you know, people, thinkers, who begin to think about the possibilities and the alternatives that exist so that the public debate and conversation could begin now and then the process we're going to get, you know, a plan that will help to sort out these problems for Nigeria. So is Nigeria's development a thing of 100 years' time? Actually, Nigeria's development can be in a generation. Why did I say that? That's what happened in uh, uh, Southeast Asia, some of this country. Within a generation or two generations, they changed from being poverty ridden to being among the industrialized world. That's what happened in Singapore. And 1960 was when Singapore got to. Malaysia, uh, Korea, we're talking about. Uh, Where's Nigeria today? Nigeria is still wallowing in poverty. Well, even Indonesia, the next and very populous country. Indonesia is far ahead of us. You know, the Nigerian story as a, is a paradox. Paradox of uh, poverty and mixed riches. No fuel, no electricity, no gas in a country where the resources are there is 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 it's unimaginable. It's a, I don't want to call it a catastrophe, but it's is the product of this uh, sharing philosophy, entitlement syndrome. You know, we have this entitlement syndrome that we're entitled to this, we are entitled to that. Government must do this for me. Government must do that for, for me. And so with that kind of entitlement syndrome, when I'm a legislator, I'm entitled to this. When I'm a state governor, I'm entitled to it. So we need to get rid of this entitlement syndrome and begin to look at 
contributions we are going to make as citizens of Nigeria to develop Nigeria. And this problem is across the level, across from even poor man's thinking to the rich man, to the elite. We are all, I think, guilty of this. We need to change our mindsets to a mindset that will foster development in Nigeria. But the way we are going, I don't think uh, the light at the end of the tunnel is very near yet. Professor Akin Wayemi, thank you for speaking with Splash FM. It's my pleasure. I've been speaking with Professor Akin Wayemi, a former president of the Nigerian Economic Society. He's also a former president of the Nigerian Association of Energy Economics. Professor Iwayemi is presently a principal investigator, Center for Petroleum Energy Economics and Law, University of Ibadan. This is the right point to draw the curtain on this edition of Economic Satellite. You have any comment? My email address is eobilo at splashfm. 1055.com eobilo at splashfm1055.com You can send me a text message. My number is 080-399-18449 You can leave a message on my Twitter page. My Twitter handle is at eobilo at eobilo I worked with Blessed Akum to bring you this edition of the program. I am Edmond Dubilo. Thank you for listening.